Great. Well, thank you, Carol. That was a very generous um, uh, and enthusiastic introduction. I uh, only wish my daughter had been listening so she could uh, hear how great I am, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad you think so. Um, the, um, as you probably remember, back in the 70s and 80s, there was the great style wars that was, was raging. And um, the uh, Stanley Tigerman did uh, something called the uh, the Titanic in 1979, in which he kind of sank Crown Hall, which was the great modernist icon. It had been built just uh, 20 years before, but maybe 25 years before, um, a sort of a short-lived icon because um, by then Charles uh, Jenks had already declared that modernism was dead. Um, uh, the uh, in '79, the same year, uh, uh, Jean-Louis Lyotard wrote the Postmodern Condition, a report on knowledge, um, in which he uh, doubted modernism's faith in reason, uh, its narrative of progress, uh, the belief in positive knowledge, deserve, uh, deduced from observable phenomena. He was challenging the dogmas of, of modernism, modernism originating in the Enlightenment. Um, the postmodern condition was about the loss of confidence in progress, the industrial pay program, et cetera. There were other assaults that had it happened earlier, of course, complexity and contradiction, 1966, the, uh, the architecture of the city by Aldo Rossi in 66, and of course, Derrida um, lectured on deconstruction in Johns Hopkins in um, uh, 1966 as well. So the question was, uh, if we're in a postmodern condition, what is the response to it? What can we do from an architectural point of view? Um, and um, uh, one response, of course, was uh, the uh, history and humanism. And Michael Graves in 1992 finished the Portland office building, uh, which was um, a uh, kind of a major event. Uh, announcing an alternative to, to modernism and an answer, an answer to all of modernism's problems. Um, the, uh, In, 10, that, uh, in 1910, the world changed. In 1983, the architectural world changed. It wasn't really so obvious because nobody had gathered these uh, these these projects together in under any rubric because there was no rubric, there was no category for them. Um, they took uh, new eyes to see. Uh, they, it was marginal work, sort of out of the hot house, boutique stuff, not duplicable, idiosyncratic, sometimes somewhat personal, but they were all intense and complex. Uh, and audacious, and they 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 kind of implied a constructive uh, difficulty that um, uh, meant that they really couldn't be built. So uh, people were amused by them; they were interested, they were provocative, but um, nobody really gave them, uh, honored them with a name. Um, this was uh, done by Thomas Laser, who uh, did a show at the um, Brooklyn Naval Yard. Uh, uh, I'm not sure where it was. It, it was in Brooklyn, it was some naval factory, uh, um, which you see in the back, background here. Anyway, he was interested in, in an object that when it, as it approaches the, the, the speed of the light disintegrates. And so you see it simultaneously from all uh, points of view. It's sort of cubist space, but not, it's not cubist, it's really Einsteinian. Um, Frank Gehry in California did the aerospace building also in 1983. Um, uh, and perhaps because he was dealing with space and outer space, uh, people gave him the benefit of the doubt. This was a state of California project. People thought the government would never go for it. They did, but it was, you're dealing with space. And so you, you see um, the distorted form, that big volume on the left looks as though it's being propelled in sort of a G G3 gravitational liftoff. Um, uh, 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 he actually took this from a coffee cup that was a cup done by an artist. That was, um, and then there's this uh, airplane that's, uh, you know, on the oblique jetting up. And, and anyway, the, the whole thing doesn't add up to a whole. Um, it's, uh, it, it's not symmetrical. It's um, beautiful, but it's not a classical beauty. 
uh, is fragmented and it's dynamic. Um, uh, and one of the interesting, fascinating things about this building is, is that the, when they, Gary presents this, this form to his office, they don't know how to draw it. Um, because they scratch their heads because it's not, uh, it's oblique to the plane and it's not uh, true to the plane. It's not orthogonal or perpendicular. So you can't do a measured drawing and extrapolate up. So they had to figure out how to do it. It's one of the premonitions to the need for a, for a, a, a computer later on. Another project in 1983 was this wonderful uh, a little footbridge uh, in a studio, only 500 square feet, uh, 18 foot ceilings. Um, the graphic artist who had this space wanted to be look at, look at paintings that he hung on the wall. And uh, Co-op Himmelblau did uh, a kind of a furious eye shut sketch of something that comes straight from their subconscious as they, after a lot of smoking and drinking, they decided that they just throw it all down on paper and they build almost every line. And um, uh, so the it's like it has the delicacy of a spider web uh, because it's it's um, engineered um, uh, to be extremely light. It's anchored on both walls. It stabilizes so the the, the that single uh, post in the middle carries all the weight partially because the the lateral forces are taken up by the walls, the masonry walls. Um, uh, the it's also kinetic. This little piece is a whole. Um, kind of lecture in itself because uh, it uh, it's not only uh, about complexity and and pushing structure structural engineering to its limits because the engineer a guy named Oscar Graf spent a lot of time being able to engineer this thing because uh, so many of the forces were indeterminate. Uh, but in addition to, to that, the that little uh, staircase you see in the background toward the window is a kinetic object. It, it's like a drawbridge. It, it's just uh, it uh, it uh, lowers so that so the graphic artist can walk up and see his paintings, and he lifts it. and And it was uh, it was one of the first examples of kinetic kinetic architecture around. But it was uh, very exploratory and, and fresh. It took new as like all this stuff took new eyes to see. People didn't know quite what to make of it. Um, and of course, Peter Eisman in 1983 opens Wexner Center in at the uh, Ohio uni, Ohio State uni, University of Ohio, um, and it has this scaffold that, that uh, powers through these otherwise static buildings, um, and it's, it's very disruptive. And what he's, I'll talk about this a little bit later, um, uh, but it uh, 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 it. it it disrupts the the equanimity of these otherwise kind of stable buildings. It destabilizes the, this whole ensemble. Um, uh, so people didn't know how to talk about these buildings as a whole. There were certainly affinities. Uh, nobody was making a correlation between them. They were kind of standalone objects that attracted a lot of press because they were so unique. Uh, but little did anyone know or predict uh, that in 35 years, uh, the, all these architects and their, their line of logic would eventuate in these international icons that were built, uh, and they were monumental as well, uh, 35, 40 years later. Um, so th this was the answer to the boredom that modernism had uh, uh, presented, that people were reacting again. Uh, the, the function was not just functionalism, but the function was to fascinate, actually. Um, uh, people wanted these buildings. Uh, I happened to be at, uh, 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 visit this airport in China not long after it was open, and people um, <laughs> would take the subway for four, half an hour, 45 minutes from Beijing with their sack lunches and come out and have lunch in this kind of forest of, of architecture, um, which was done by Zaha Hadid, of course, in 2019, is the Beijing Daijing International Airport. It was a fresh astonishment. Um, uh, that's also true of Frank Gehry's Fondation uh, Vuitton in Paris, um, which um, uh, uh, was finished in 2017. Um, and this is, you could, there's a kind of a linear, nonlinear, uh, sequence from his aerospace museum to this um, is uh, kind of equally improbable, but infinitely more sophisticated, certainly um, helped by this computer. Uh, the um, uh, Another building of, of this monumental sort 
Uh, a lot of these buildings are built in China because the Chinese cities are very competitive. They're culturally competitive, um, and and they uh, you actually see posters of buildings uh, on fences to advertise the newest astonishment. This is one uh, in Dalian in the in the very north by Koa Um also um, uh, enigmatic. Uh, but the the uh, mayor of the city saw their BMW plant in. Um, in Stuttgart, I believe it was, uh, and he wanted one because he wanted to compete with um, uh, the Daos uh, in uh, uh, in Switzerland for an international conference. So he needed some iconic building uh, that would attract international attention. It advertised Daijing, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the city, uh, not Daijing, but um, uh, Taij I can't remember the name of the city, sorry. Um, uh, but. Um, uh, and also it's at the end of a new city, uh, at the end of an axis, and so it actually terminates the axis, and so it becomes a symbol within the city as well. Um, uh, this is, has a Pyrenean space inside. Uh, the building is basically a shell of a, a continuous wall and, and roof um, that uh, uh, covers uh, a, a tripartite scheme inside. It, it's, there's an opera house, a theater, um, and a... Um, other performance spaces inside, um, uh, and then the last of the you know to to give the the, the five projects from 1983 a little bit of symmetry. This is Peter Eisenman, who um, um, in 2011 finishes the city of uh, of culture, which is um, uh, does to a certain extent what he did in in uh, the Wexner Center. He takes surrounding streets and and um, uh, uh, pilgrimage routes and, and traces them with a grid across the roof of uh, this hillscape, which matches the hillscape, he'll say, uh, in, in just outside of the city. And inside, uh, it's um, uh, uh, kind of a delirious landscape of forms. Um, it's quite fascinating. Tragically, um, the, the spirit behind the project uh, died before it was completed. And so uh, three of the only three, one of the four parts of this project is not completed, so there's kind of a hole. Um, uh, uh, and so it, it, it would have been his masterpiece, but for the, the fact that it won't be complete, but it's a fascinating building. Anyway, but it, it consummates a long line of, of um, investigation. Um, the uh, I'd like this, our little chat today, tonight, to talk about the book and how it, it came about, the story of the book, as well as the story of the architecture. Um, uh, uh, I had a meeting with um, a woman, an editor, Alexander Penny, 1987, who called me into her, her office. She was an editor, a double day, to, to, to see if I wanted to write about the 100 most interesting objects in, um, uh, in, the, in the MoMA collection. Uh, that didn't interest me so much. And she said, well, what does interest me? Uh, and on the spot, I really hadn't thought of it before, I, but I said, you know, there are a number of architects who are interested in chaos and it's an interesting thing for architects to be interested in because chaos would seem to be the um, uh, antithesis of what the priests of order would normally design and, and and she said well you know think about it and uh, write a proposal and um, uh, and and uh, tellingly at the elevator she said uh, think of a name um, so uh, uh, what was happening was that a number of architects, uh, were reading chaos because science chaos uh, among the, the gifts that the computer gave us was the ability to look at, at, at complex natural phenomena and find order in disorder. And that started in the 1960s and by the 70s or 80s, the literature was out there um, uh, in articles, separate articles and, and books. And then and a guy named James Glick did a best-selling book called Chaos uh, sometime later who put it all together. So he made the science of chaos accessible, uh, but some uh, scholars of chaos um, uh, it went into it by themselves. This is a, um, uh, 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 a drawing of, by uh, a young architect named Peter Anders, done in 1985. He was a recent graduate of the, uh, Columbia, and he was reading chaos theory and, and applying the chaos theory to architectural space. So um, the spiral and all these events of nature become uh, a subject. Um, in 1979, 
uh, the uh, Gunter Domenig in Southern Austria started building a house that was inspired by um, the mountainside uh, uh, near his, uh, here's his, his, uh, his office in Graz. Um, and the farm buildings that start just at the edge of the, there's an edge between the, the mountains and the uh, uh, uncultivated mountains and, and the first farms and where there, where there are also farm buildings. And so he did a, a drawing that collapses the, the rocks of the mountainside, the boulders and the farm structures um, and eventually does this house. And he builds over about 17 years. This is, I mean, nobody knows how to build this stuff. Um, he, uh, you can't build it off a drawing. Um, it turns out that uh, he kind of invented, as did other people at the time, um, an XYZ coordinate system so that um, with lasers, the contractors could build um, spot points in space uh, rather than trying to uh, measure it up from the ground or from any zero point. There's no zero point in this house. Um, uh, uh, Frank Gehry uh, looks at chaos of a different order. He's looking at the, uh, the chaos of Los Angeles, you know, the streetscape with all the, the, the materials that people don't want to think about, uh, uh, including, including um, uh, chain link fencing and corrugated iron and, and uh, asphalt and plywood and, and so he he constructs a um, uh, uh, his house enveloping a, a very charming uh, Dutch colonial cottage um, which he carves away. Um, he's been influenced by Gordon Matta Clark who's carved away his houses but uh, uh, carved away structures but um, uh, uh, the, uh, so Gary carves away the, the cottage and he builds around it in this Rauschenberg uh, combine, um, but it's inspired by the urban chaos, which he's tr he tries to in some way articulate as uh, the artists do in New York with their combines. And, and this picture above is a, a street in New York uh, that, um, a, a picture of the street that Peter Anders took, the, that's the Columbia student. Um, and then Peter, uh, Peter Eisman, as I said before, um, was taking the urban chaos from this area in uh, Columbia, where uh, it happens to sit on a fault line between a, a, an avenue north of which the engineers or the surveyors in the 19th century did a grid, south of which there's another set of engineers did another grid, and the, the two grids didn't meet. Um, and so there's a fault line between the cities, uh, the, between the north and south part of the uh, of the city, and he builds on the builds on the fault, fault line. Um, uh, you know, building on the fault is a really fascinating subject because you're you're building on instability. Uh, Levius Woods later, much later, would uh, be hired by the uh, San Francisco Museum of uh, Modern Art to do a show uh, called "Building on the Fall," i.e., designing for the earthquakes in San Francisco. This is an engineered fault line and a surveys fault line, and and so he he takes the um, the two grids and meshes them through each other so that neither one dominates. They they argue with each other. They don't agree. Um, and uh, um, and he builds a, a building on the disagreement. Um, and so, uh, and in the landscape, uh, you can't really see it here, but these, the topography um, of these um, uh, uh, planters uh, is, is heaves because some of them are higher, some of them are lower. So it's actually a heaving landscape as well. So you have all this stuff, um, uh, three, there's three dimensionally active as, as well. Um, so uh, in, in terms of nature's chaos, here you have three systems, uh, a cloud system and a lightning system, and of course it's a, a tree system, all of which are, are forms of beauty that architects didn't have any access to before the, before the computer, computer. These are nonlinear phenomena. Um, and uh, whereas before uh, architects might, be inspired like uh, um, uh, Isazaki was inspired by the Euclidean geometries in the 80s, the pyramid, the cone, the you know the, the rest of the geometries. Uh, they didn't have to uh, uh, obey that anymore. The, this is post-Euclidean. Um, so Carl Pimbleblau, uh, it doesn't want to build pyramids. Uh, they uh, in this drawing of 
something called the open house. Um, they, uh, they, as I said before, they would have these jam sessions and they, they discuss what they wanted, what they were interested in, and then in just uh, you know, a couple of minutes, scribble something down. And, and then they would tease out the building from these uh, irrational drawings that were really subconscious eruptions. Of course, the Carl Pimmelblau are uh, uh, architects practicing Vienna and the um, uh, Freud is to these guys as Derrida is to um, uh, uh, Peter Eisenman and other architects. Um, uh, it's a source of, um, of responsibility, inspiration, and, and anyway, they're 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 allowing their subconscious to speak. They're they're um, they're they're allowing their reason to be uh, kind of submerged by the subconscious in these bursts of drawing. They then rationalize the the uh, the buildings and and tease out what is it. This is a simultaneous drawing. The sketches it has both the seeds of the plan and the um, the section. Um, uh, and um, it becomes it, it becomes engineered, and it was almost built. Um, uh, it was also commissioned by a psychiatrist in Los Angeles, um, who himself, I'm sure, uh, related to the notion that this was this building came out of this out of a subconscious, professional subconscious. The um, the rooftop rendering. This is uh, 1988, considerably later. Um, uh, uh, is a remodeling done by Carl Pimbelblau. And here, the, their particular um, uh, chaos is they imagine this truss to be a stroke of lightning that, uh, uh, that comes up from the street to become a, um, uh, this roof, rooftop. The, uh, it's actually a lawyer's office. Um, and it's kind of a new form of space. It's highly filigreed. Um, they go on to other forms of chaos, the um, uh, turbulence, um, and this is not only uh, called Pimbalau, but uh, all architects are interested in these forms of, of um, disturbance that are uh, escape regularity uh, from order into a form of disorder, which actually is a, 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 just a different form of order. They build the, um, the Museum of the Confluence in Lyon, um, uh, uh, between two rivers. This is on an island, so the two rivers, the Sonne and the Rhone, converge just beyond this building, so the, the eddies. Uh, there are highways that also uh, bypass this area. There are bridges that, that cross through the area. So it's a, it's a turbulent spot, it's a, a zone of, of, of um, uh, agitation. Um, so so um, these are um, all non normative buildings. Um, and uh, so the book I finally proposed to my editor at Doubleday is um, uh, about an alternative architecture. And, and, and I think of it as an alternative history of alternative architecture. And, and that's what basically um, uh, is what I uh, what you see on the shelf at Rizzoli now. Um, uh, she had asked me to give this, this, uh, uh, you know, this architecture a name. Uh, and I had spent the summer uh, while writing the proposal, thinking of the name and, and deconstructivism came to mind because it was a confluence of architects who were influenced by constructivism and deconstruction. Um, but um, uh, but others were in, but it was not a comprehensive name that, that is to say that term didn't apply to all because some were interested in Russian constructivism, some in Derridian deconstruction, some by neither, some by both. Um, the terms uh, but the, the point is the terms con constructivism um, and con deconstruction run through each other and they don't necessarily relate to each other. The point is, um, uh, the just as Peter Eisenman had threaded to these two different grids through each other, these two terms threaded to each other and they were kind of independent. They didn't establish a consolidated movement. Um, uh, and among the other architects, um, they were interested in art or phenomenology or philosophy or performance or disciplinarity, uh, event spaces, uh, uh, interpretation, textuality. The point is um, uh, the, 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 the name was emblematic of an architecture that had lots of cross currents uh, that didn't resolve themselves into a whole. Um, uh, uh, this building by uh, uh, Bernard Chumi, for example, at Parc Villette, 
um, uh, is a performative building because he was interested in performance art. Um, uh, he was interested in deconstruction, uh, and he, uh, when he looked for a language, he looked for uh, the constructivists, um, and so he built this thing that um, is is um, is deconstructionist because it has multiple systems that pass through each other that don't necessarily coordinate. Uh, it's a performance building. It's infected by performance art. He was deeply involved in performance art because. Um, uh, it, it's a performative building. You climb up the spiral stairs, or you uh, walk on this gangplank at the top and look out, or uh, it's a jungle gym. So it invites an activity. Uh, and so it becomes uh, uh, an event that you can participate in. It's a general jungle gym. So it has a lot of things going forward in addition to the, the uh, uh, direct reference to the transformations of, of a number of uh, uh, constructive, uh, constructive as architects coming out of the 20s. Um, so, um, uh, but the, um, the, the book that I wrote and finished in 1992, uh, by this time, my editor left Doubleday and my agent had sold the book to uh, editor at Knopf. And anyway, so I, I presented the book in 1992 to Knopf and my editor said, well, uh, you know, it's hard to follow, um, put it all in chronological order. And I said, well, you know, this is a book about nonlinearity. Uh, the whole idea of chronology defeats the, the point of the architecture. So I, I really don't want to do it. And so we, um, uh, I withdrew the book and, and put it on the shelf. I uh, frankly didn't have the energy to uh, <laughs> uh, go back into it. And I, I put it on the shelf for about 20 years. Um, and, uh, and then uh, I, but I took it off, we were moving and I took it off the shelf to move and, and I, I started reading it, sat down. And, and I thought, you know, this is actually quite interesting. Nobody's written about this stuff. And in the meantime, I had written about a lot of stuff that had happened in the meantime, because I um, was continued to be fascinated by the architecture. The architects were still um, uh, working and at ever larger scale. Um, and um, their work evolved, it changed. Um, it was never the same twice. Um, um, and so um, I, uh, I proposed uh, my agent brought it to Rizzoli and they bought it. So I proposed um, uh, embedding the deconstructivist book in a longer book, uh, because by this time I realized that deconstructivism per se was really part of a much longer avant-garde movement that it started in the, in the early 19th century, in the in 19th century. And of course it had continued from 1992 through the digital period. So I had to bring the for book forward by 20 years, and I, and I wanted to take it back to its roots um, through the century um, uh, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, so um, the um, the uh, and when I brought it back to the 19th century, the uh, it I, it took me past um, what were what I call the five horsemen of the apocalypse. There were um, uh, there were events that had happened in uh, science, art, philosophy, history, and culture that were really seismic. So the, 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 by the time you get into the mid 20th century, it's no longer the, the same um, zeitgeist that you had going in the 19th century. It was really a different reality altogether. So um, uh, the, uh, the episteme had really changed. So in, in mathematics you and geometry, science, and technology, you have uh, Gauss, Lobachevsky, Poincaré, who are all interested in uh, challenging Euclidean geometry uh, uh, in various forms. They introduce uh, uh, topologies, uh, curved surfaces. Uh, uh, and then you, you go down through the century, um, uh, into the early 20th century, late 19th is a fourth dimension. They're looking at other dimensions. Uh, oh, sorry, I don't want to do that. Albert Einstein, of course, uh, Max Planck, Niels Bohr, Rutherford splits the iron, Heisenberg, the uncertainty principle, Rene Tom, uh, the uh, uh, catastrophe theory, of course, the advent of uh, the digital and cyberspace and, and, and chaos science. Um, so, uh, so, as a result of all this, 
Newton's mechanical system is no longer stable and universal. It's one system among other systems. Um, and because of in the aggregate, these the, all, all these uh, seismic discoveries in science really vaporize solid matter. You're dealing with probability and quanta. Uh, uh, um, yeah, these are sciences of, uh, the sciences that were yielding uncertainty. Um, uh, and, and you were shifting from analog to, to digital as well toward the end. In, in the, the fourth dimension, the fourth dimension was really fi fascinating because uh, the, uh, uh, it, was, it was pursued by mystics who were grounding their research in what they considered kind of a scientific kind of consideration. They, they believed that if you can extrapolate a second, third dimension from a, from a second dimension, you can extrapolate a fourth dimension from the third. So um, here is Malievich um, uh, introducing a four-dimensional construct in, into a third-dimensional city. Um, and so he, and this is all done before Einstein uh, kind of nails time as the fourth dimension. Uh, uh, the, the, a lot of these architects were considering space as the fourth dimension. Um, and, um, uh, and so it's a new reality as opposed to the reality, the realism of you, that you see in, in back. This is a 19th century, a 20th century city, the high rise, of course. Um, it's a gridded high rise, but the detailing is um, uh, classical, of course. And so it, it, these are buildings that are, think they're palaces in the, uh, in, in the sky. And, and so they're, they're both um, gridded and st highly structured, uh, but it comes out of it, the Renaissance and that, that uh, all the rationalism of that time. So um, um, these um, early 20th century art movements, we'll talk about them later, become the basis for uh, some of the people in, from 1983, they go back into um, these ignored periods of, of, of uh, modernism because the Bauhaus has emerged triumphant. Uh, Bauhaus and its functionalism um, survives Nazi Germany and migrates to the United States where it's ensconced at Harvard, IIT, using modern art, becomes the law of the land. Zaha Hadid goes back to Malievich and um, here, and she, she constructs these kind of otherworldly um, uh, spaces that are dematerialized, that where you don't really find an edge that defines it. Um, there, there's no grounding, they're groundless, they're floating, there's no center um, structure, it's destructured because the, uh, even the, the concrete columns have halos at the, 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 their feet and at their crown uh, because they're not supporting anything because this is, kind of an, um, she's building infinity, the infinities of, of the fourth dimension. Um, uh, the um, Thomas Laser uh, is uh, uh, doing, exploring relativity. We're still in the, in the, 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 the ruptures that science and mathematics have, have brought to uh, the, in the 19th century physics. So uh, this is um, Thomas Laser who's, who's doing a, uh, a model of a room that shows architects' basics is, is a, called room window furniture. It's a four-sided room in the throes of relativity, uh, and uh, it's basically a, 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 it shows the space with the simultaneity of a, of a cubist canvas. Um, relativity uh, influences Zaha Hadid here in 2006, where she proposes one of the Guggenheim branches in, um, in Taiwan, where the, the relativity here is, it's like famously uh, in explaining uh, Einstein's relativity, uh, 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 when I studied it, it was, you, you understood it to a certain extent, because if you're in train in, in, train in, a new, uh, in a train station and one train moves and the other doesn't, you don't know really which train is moving um, uh, because one is relative to the other. And in this building, um, the uh, parts and whole blocks move. And so that you don't really, it's a kinetic building and, and um, you don't know which is really the ground and which is the locomotive here, the car, this car that's moving. So uh, Einstein gets absorbed. Um, and then in philosophy, psychology, um, you know, this all comes out of Nietzsche, the, um, uh, it, it, Nietzsche reacts against Kantian reason and Hegelian synthesis, and um, he 
it crosses the Rubicon into uncertainty and dynamism. Um, so, uh, and he, his philosophies engender a whole sequence of other philosophies, the philosophies of uncertainty, the philosophers, of, philosophers of time, change, and becoming, uh, Bergson, Husserl, Heidegger, Foucault, um, uh, Derrida, of course, uh, I should have put Derrida in here. Um, and then from a psychological point of view, we've got Freud, Jung, and Lacan, where the psyche is no longer integrated, stratified, we're no longer in the whole human being in control of oneself. The gods are within us, struggling and arguing, uh, the, uh, our selves are layered. So um, uh, uh, Liz Diller, uh, Diller Scofidio does this uh, anti-foundational building you're all familiar with because it's in New York, it's called the shed. Um, and there's no foundation here because it, it moves, it's, it's kinetic, it's not grounded, it's on wheels. Uh, but in addition to the fact that it, it, it wheels out from the underbelly of the, the skyscraper, the skyscraper um, all the walls uh, are guillotine walls, they rise and close, and, and others are shuttered walls that open and fold. Um, and so the building is fully operational. When it's fully operational, it's, you almost never see the same thing twice. Um, and so it's, it's, it's kind of a, a spatially uncertain because it, 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 you, you don't know um, what it wants to be, what it could be. Uh, it depends on the creativity of the director dealing with this and the performances that go on within it. Um, so it deals with the uh, certain uh, uncertainties of, of, um, of uh, the uh, you know, the philosophy that we're dealing with, the groundless philosophy, philosophy that's grounded, it's lost its ground in positive, uh, uh, positive um, points. Is philosophies without centers, without margins, uh, without edges, without conf confines. Um, the um, Derrida was uh, 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 instrumental in looking in fact at the margins to because he was he was interested in not the grand narrative but the sub narratives that frequently was interested in uh, interesting as the narratives and and um that kind of displace the the main narratives and so it, it invites a dialogue between the two um so here you're looking of course at, at Brunelleschi's Duomo in Duomo in, in Florence which is the uh, Brunelleschi invented perspective which is one of the uh, systems of control that the uh, architects uh, I'm talking about uh, fight with, because in order to liberate the margins, liberate the subtext, um, you have to, in some way, um, uh, argue with a system of control. So there's one of the dominant systems of control, of course, this pers perspective is ordering, is measuring, et cetera. Inside the dome, it's a, of course the double dome, this is the passage between the two domes on the right. You see the 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 the, um, the curves of the domes um, uh, round themselves around this path. Uh, there's almost no true vertical in it, but this is kind of the suppressed um, subconscious of this, this in the skull of this uh, this building. Um, and um, uh, it's basically the subject of, of my book. It's the, it's the repressed other. Uh, and Derrida was, was great about um, uh, arguing about um, uh, in his radiocinations about how to expose, how to reveal the, the other. Um, the, uh, and Lacan and, and uh, the other uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and, and uh, uh, um, uh, theorists um, a deal with um, uh, the integrated self. You know, it's, you know, the humanist man is uh, is is a whole. Uh, it's it, here. Leonardo draws the Vitruvian man. Uh, uh, the with the, his proportional system. This is the per, per, perfect proportions of the ideal man. There is an ideal. Um, uh, and he, the ideal of the body relates to the building and, and by extrapolation to the universe. Um, uh, but uh, with the 20th century uh, psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, we now know the, the man is not so integrated, um, that he's layered, fragmented, um, not always in, in control, he's not an integrated whole, there are forces uh, in the psyche as there are in the city and as in the building. Um, uh, that are constantly um, 
uh, coursing through each other like the knowledge grids that Foucault talks about. Um, so in art, there are, uh, you know, there's a, a, this is another one of my uh, horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, besides science and philosophy, we have art. We go through cubism, futurism, Cuba for which futurism and supremacism comes from rationalism, data, surrealism, expressionism, situationism. This gets back to my book um, because I um, uh, some of the uh, art movements that are uh, we're looking at are transgressive. Uh, some of them are aberrant, um, but there's a whole. Uh, um, uh, uh, these are different approaches to art that are. Um, uh, not linear, uh, certainly, but are, um, uh, you know, the challenge the system and, and sometimes agree with the system, sometimes disagree with the system. Uh, the the disagreements would be Dada and surrealism, of course, um, suprematism too. Um, but the point is, there, um, there are either progressive or transgressive or abstract, and they all move away from the realism of the Greco-Roman art, which is dominated through, dom, dominates through, the, I would say, 1910, um, uh, uh, 1915. Uh, the Bauhaus um, kind of takes over the rationalism from the, uh, the Greco-Roman tradition. And although it's not narrative in the same way, uh, it's functionalist uh, and it, it does perpetuate the rationalism out of the Enlightenment and, and out, of the, uh, out of the Renaissance. Um, but the, um, these movements become foundational for the architects rebelling against the Bauhaus, um, uh, uh, which kind of defines modernism for the century. Um, so these, these movements would all be uh, inspirations and sources for new directions for the architects in 1983. Um, we talked about Zaha looking at the, um, uh, at the suprematists. We're also looking at, um, uh, here is the, uh, uh, exercise in the surrealist game of the exquisite corpse where uh, Wolf Pricks and um, uh, Claude Braha each do uh, a drawing of a project this they're submitting for a competition and tour uh, and so uh, they don't see what the other artists what the other artists have drawn and so that they they do um, this uh, uh, exercise in blindness, in blind, blind editions. Um, uh, so that's kind of irrational. Um, uh, Bernard Chumi looks at the situationists. The situationists are, are they, they are, um, uh, they go into the city, uh, they want to, um, uh, to disrupt the society of the consumer society by taking going on uh, unexpected trips, finding uh, new ways of looking at the city to bring. They think that the television has swallowed reality. They wanted to to um, uh, reify experience so that it's no longer a matter of simulacra. Uh, Bernard Schumi does uh, pass through the uh, Parc La Villette. Um, hoping to that the intersection of all his paths that are overlaid, that he'll uh, create a, 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 an urban performance of episodic events, chance encounters, and planned promenades, um, urban simulations. So history itself has its own disruptions. Um, uh, 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 World War One, gas war for Russian Revolution, deep, deep, the Depression, collapse of Wall Street and a gold standard rise of fashion, all of this um, is pretty disruptive. Paul Valéry in 1935 says that for the last 20 years, neither matter nor space nor time have been what it was from time immemorial. It's a discontinuous history. Um, history is advanced by abrupt change, not by gradualism. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, for example, in culture, the uh, man has landed on the moon Outer space is now feasible, and um, these are Austrians, all of them, Hans Holein, uh, uh, Hans Rucker uh, in Kassel, uh, and Karl Pimmelblau in Basel, um, um, uh, uh, in, in bubbles of space. So they dematerialize. You know, what would a lunar landing, how would that impact uh, our space on Earth? And then in culture, 
the, we have the culture wars. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's not necessarily the culture wars, it's just the disruptions in culture. Elvis Presley, The Beatles, The Pill, LSD, Assassinations, Rita Franklin, Paris in 68, the Vietnam, uh, feminism, cyberspace, computer, the internet. Um, uh, so these are uh, uh, all issues that disrupt um, space and uh, uh, and architecture as we know know it from from uh, you know nineteen from the time of Grand Central. Um, so the, the um, uh, so as a result, um, we're looking at. Uh, a paradigm shift from the reality that that Leonardo drew in back of uh, the Mona Lisa to a different um, reality that this is a an artist who um, uh, uh, was a friend and and um, friend of uh, uh, Claude Barra who designed this apartment for her and then she added her own paintings as well. So this is a um, a, a different realism. I mean, it's a different reality. It's, it's against the realism that we know that comes out of Greek, the Greek or Roman tradition. Um, it's, uh, it's deconstructed space rather than constructed space. Um, uh, and uh, the uh, in terms of the cultural displacement, um, the you know the man as we know him from the uh, Vitruvian man by Leonardo could have been the Vitruvian woman painted by um, uh, Gaetano Pesce here, or here's Aha Di standing next to the modulor uh, and uh, at the Unité d'Habitation in, in Marseille. Um, and so Corb has a six foot guy who is a, actually a British um, uh, soccer player uh, uh, or athlete, I should say. Uh, he's the um, module around whom the, he's designed this uh, building, a machine for living, what he calls a unité. Uh, and so he's still thinking that you can have a unified reality um, uh, and build around man as a normative, as the norm. And so everything is calibrated to the reach of his arm. The windows um, you know, are as long as the, the, the reach, his reach can reach. Um, is scaled to this guy. Zaha, of course, has different ideas about it. And so it's, it's quite wonderful to think of her as a feminist figure. Um, and she's basically saying, um, I'm a woman, first of all. Uh, I'm an Arab woman. I'm not Muslim. I'm not normative. I'm, you know, who is normative? Um, uh, and so she's um, uh, challenging man as a, a norm within a mass produced, uh, industrially produced building. Uh, so this this new architecture is basically um, trying to challenge uh, the notions of control, spatial control, systems of control. Here is the penitentiary, the opticon, um, a panopticon, I should say, where a guard at the center can can survey all of the the uh, um, prisoners uh, down these rows around. But it could be in an insane asylum. It could be kids in a in a um, uh, um, a orphanage, um, but it's a system of control. And Foucault points this out brilliantly in, in his writing on the on the Panopticon, um, uh, and basically says architecture is a form of control. Um, so these architects out of 1983, including Dillard Scafidi, are challenging that. Here is a, uh, uh, a scene from something called the Rotary Nor Notary, a play at La Mama that was based on. Um, uh, uh, um, what's his name? The, uh, the artist. Uh, um, anyway, um, it's a play that scrambles space with mirrors, so that here you have the hero, the the, uh, the subject of the movie, the the bachelor, um, uh, 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 and he's decapitated, and all, so his body is just detached from here. Anyway, the, these mirrors pivot and they swivel, so that the space. That you normally see on a proscenium stage is no longer the, uh, the realistic space that you think. It's a different kind of space. So they've 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 uh, they've challenged panoptical space and spaces of control. So um, the existing order is um, that the realistic order that you see on the right here is Apollonia. Uh, it's uh, it's a system of control. Um, it 
uh, respects Euclid, Newtonian mechanics, uh, the Cartesian grid in the background here, which comes out of the same rationale, the same enlightenment, gravity hierarchy, orthogonality, functionalism. Um, there, there's just all sorts of controls um, uh, that uh, are being challenged. The HVAC system is a system of control. Everything is closed in all these buildings back here. Um, so the architects are challenging that. Zaha does this in um, uh, uh, the, the space she kind of invents when she does a um, 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 tableau in acrylic uh, where she explores alternate kinds of space. Um, there is a history of this kind of challenge. The uh, Garden of uh, the Monsters in Momarzo, the Sacred Grove in 16th century in Viterbo. Uh, you walk under through this mouth and, and the, the little Inscription says, "All reason departs." Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, the the tower is uh, built uh, on leaning. Uh, it's no longer reasonable. Gravity is questioned. Um, uh, in uh, this is of all people, uh, uh, Gropius designed this. is the uh, uh, It's the monument to the March dead in 1922. Um, it's an expressionist uh, monument that, expressing the grief. Uh, for a number of, of, of um, workers who were killed during the march against fascism. Um, and um, uh, he goes on to suppress expressionism, which he practiced very beautifully uh, early in the Rauhaus House as he capitulates to the functionalism of the machine and factory uh, production and all that. And um, so functional, uh, the expressions become somewhat repressed. Um, uh, another Kind of repressed narrative is surrealism. Here is De Chirico, um, and uh, a building by Massimiliano Fuxas in Italy, 1979, the Pagliano Gymnasium. Fuxas had worked for De Chirico as a young man, and and um, uh, and De Chirico himself was uh, interested in Nietzsche, um, and who was uh, in interested in the contradictory perspectives uh, that Nietzsche wrote about. Um, uh, so. Expressionism survives by a thread. Um, Yugoslavia, a uh, monument to the um, uh, the fallen in uh, in the Second World War. Um, speaking of building on the fall, this is a building. Uh, I'm, I'm going through precedents that uh, for the architecture uh, that uh, uh, is the substance of the book. Um, this is built. Speaking of building on the fall, this is a, um, a cultural center in Skopje that was built in the uh, in the wake of a, an earthquake and that destroyed the city uh, in 1963. This is um, by a Slovenian firm called uh, Bureau 71. It's a cultural complex, um, force-generated form. The, but the first architect who was a major figure in the paradigm shift, um, as opposed to simply doing um, something that isn't followed up is a guy named uh, Claude Parha and his, who with his partner Paul Virilio uh, discovered the oblique. Um, Virilio is a student of the Second World War and he, he walks into bunkers that are um, destabilized because they've slid off their foundations and, and you walk into these bunkers and there's no vertical or horizontal, the orthogonal doesn't have any sense any longer. And so you're in a tip space and it does something to the body. So you walk up and you, you feel weight and you walk down and it pushes you down. Uh, so they rationalize this. He's a phenomenologist, um, uh, which predates deconstruction, of course, and leads into deconstruction. Um, and he's, he's interested in thinking through your body, experiencing through your body. It's an experiential architecture. And, and then he and, and um, uh, Claude Barhan uh, theorized a building, the oblique, which they call the function of the oblique. In the same year that Venturi publishes Complexity on Contradiction, Rossi, the city, um, uh, and Derrida, the, uh, um, his uh, paper on deconstruction, Virilio and Abraham published the function of the oblique. Um, it's a new condition for architecture. It's not the horizontal of classicism. It's not the verticality of modernism and the high rise, but it's a, it's a new condition. Um, and they build it in this uh, uh, church called the uh, Saint Bernadette in, uh, in Nevers, France, um, where they, uh, they build the uh, floors 
on the oblique. They also fracture the bunker that they were fascinated by so that it now has light coming in through the skylights and through, through the walls. So they're, they're adding another major theme of this stuff, the, the fracture. Um, uh, and, and they're creating, uh, building this phenomenal because of, of the, the, the little place of light inside, but also because um, uh, your perception of the building is physical. You understand the building, uh, non-incidentally, the, the, the uh, people who are during funeral services, if the, <laughs> the priest put a casket on the beer, uh, the beer, the casket would tend to slide off because of the angle. Um, in, unless they blocked it. Um, so uh, 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 he, uh, uh, Graham goes on to make a career out of the oblique. Here in 1970, the Venice Biennale, uh, he um, does uh, the, installs an interior uh, where the artists are, are, are um, functioning, they're responding with their art to this, these oblique spaces. Um, the uh, artist before who was sitting, the, Mona, the deconstructivist Mona, uh, Mona Lisa did, uh, this is her apartment again, but it shows kind of the different spatiality that he's encouraging um, uh, and built with these uh, buildings. He go, goes on to um, a house in, in uh, 1972 uh, in the Cap d'Antibes in the south of France, and then a, a, um, a, a uh, supermarket of all things on the oblique. He takes advantage of the slopes and and um, uh, and he he has a number of uh, acolytes. He, 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 a lot of de directest descendants who either admit it or don't admit it. But uh, 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 Jean Nouvel, who did this house on the right, um, uh, uh, is the Vigo house uh, in the south of France again. Uh, but here in Manhattan, he verticalizes the oblique with the MoMA Tower, 53 West 30, 53rd. This all comes out of Clubrahan. Uh, uh, um, and then Jean Nouvel, um, who actually um, came back to Clubrahan uh, after a long absence. That's a long story um, because Clubrahan fell out of favor for about 20, 25 years because of his political positions. Uh, he built a lot of nuclear reactors in France, and nobody liked it. The, the avant-garde didn't like it, so he lost his patronage. Uh, but, uh, but belatedly, uh, uh, Nouvelle comes back and does the Philharmonic in Paris, uh, above and below here, where um, these are paths on the oblique, uh, crisscrossing the building, and, and then his uh, National Museum in Doha, where everything is on the oblique, the floor and ceilings, um, uh, it's uh, the imagery comes out of the desert rose, the d d desert rose crystal um, is a fragment. So uh, it, nature is oblique as well. Um, uh, so uh, Rem Koolhaas is, is uh, he, does not, he doesn't really mention it or only reluctantly, uh, but there's a lot of the oblique in uh, the ramps in his buildings. The, uh, the, the, the library of Jussieu, the competition upper right, was uh, predicated on ramps. Uh, ramp, uh, um, Virilio himself said, there's nothing new about the ramp. We didn't invent the ramp. We just said you could occupy the ramp. And so here, Ram occupies the ramp with book stacks or depending on the angle of inclination, it's either a passage or a, a stationary place desks, um, uh, the, uh, you determine the function, the angle of determines the function. In the um, uh, Netherlands Embassy in 2003, he basically ramps the inside of the building so that you're, you're um, not in a mechanism, you're not in an elevator, you're, you're floating through the space. Um, some of these ramps are actually staircases, but they're, they basically ramps through the building. Doha ram, ram does this whole library, National Library on the oblique, um, uh, the floor planes and ceilings is a, it's a double plane. Um, uh, and uh, the uh, Oslo uh, Opera House of uh, 2008, it's an oblique landscape um, and, and uh, a building as a landscape. And uh, in 2007, Weissman and Freddy do the Olympia Sculpture Park at the Seattle Art Museum. Uh, they have to uh, get from the upper city down to the wharves and they do it 
uh, with these long obliques is basically a propylea that you see in front of the, the um, uh, Acropolis, uh, but is elongated and monumentalized. Um, the, um, so uh, the, in terms of the picking up the repressed histories, a lot of these archetypes go back to expressionism, surrealism, constructivism, suprematism. Zaha goes back to the suprematists, the fourth dimension. Here, um, uh, uh, the, um, the prune uh, upper, upper images by uh, Lizitsky, he uses different forms of describing three-dimensional space and, and use them in a contradictory way. So he creates impossible spaces that are sort of mis mysterious. Uh, and then as we talked about this before, that this suprematist space is, is um, collage into the, uh, the Renaissance city, the, the rational city. So, so these are, uh, uh, she, so although Zaha doesn't, is not really a theorist, she channels theory that's embedded in this other era. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it was, <laughs> it was actually uh, Einstein who said that he knew more about, learned more about space from Dostoevsky than he did from other mathematicians, because in the brothers Karamazov, uh, Dostoevsky has one brother, Karamazov say to the other brother Karamazov say, saying, how can you understand God um, and infinity and the place where two parallel lines cross with a Euclidean mindset? Um, there have to be other ways of other mathematics, other ways of understanding um, uh, uh, the, the, the space of infinity, the space of God, Godhead. Um, and, um, uh, and so there's a mysticism implied because there's a religious undertone to what he's saying. Um, and and um, so uh, so these uh, suprematists are looking at the fourth dimension sort of scientifically, and and Einstein has read Dostoevsky, and, and um, you know the rest is history, of course. Um, uh, Zaha goes. On, this is um, the uh, Broad Art Gallery in Michigan State, which is highly distorted. Um, uh, there's a uh, it's, there's an otherworldly aspect to it, uh, and then her, um, uh, she breaks with the Renaissance perspective in the Vitra Museum where she, she takes these three volumes and have, has each of them vanished to a different vanishing point so that the perspective doesn't add up to the Renaissance whole. It's, it's um, a conflicted space. So she's realizing in three dimensions what, um, uh, what, the supremacist uh, really confined to the uh, sec second dimension. So she does the same thing in her, she comes out of the picture plane, she, two dimensions becoming three, becoming four. Um, she also bends space, she stretches space here. I see that uh, Carol has appeared and, and um, I'm going to talk of just briefly about more about perspective here. Uh, uh, Manfred Plotek subverts uh, uh, the 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 Euclidean volume of his space high, um, and with mirrors and stripes, uh, it's just a small little space. But he creates his own infinity. He dedicates this, uh, telling the to Kurt Schwitters, who fractured form, uh, uh, Plotens fractured space, um, and then um, here uh, Eisenman in the um, uh, Wexner Center detaches the vanishing point from the horizon line and creates this alternative space that's strange. He defamiliarizes de 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 space so that you really don't know what you're getting here. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, and then he's done this, he's done the same thing with the grid as well as perspective. So in the building for the carpet, uh, for the uh, uh, Wexner Center, he's relativized the grid, he's relativized perspective uh, so that by, and, and then here's a, little um, logo that diagrams these uh, the, the spatial relativity that he's building to the building. So you, you, you get um, a, a spatial conundrum, basically, uh, that he three-dimensionalizes it. I could go on. I have lots of slides. Carol is uh, there. I, my time is up. Uh, let me just um, strafe through uh, the rest of the slides to show you uh, 
you know, this this as this is multiple systems as it appears in nature. You don't have to go to Derrida to understand this stuff. This just is a, a picture of the Midwest where the grid is ruptured by a river, uh, and these rivers tend to walk, you know, get, go to mountains that rupture the grid as well. So th these are multiple systems, multiple systems that partly let multiple systems in uh, in uh, uh, Tom Main's building back in Austria, multiple systems. Energy fields, energy fields. Um, uh, this is a, um, a bubble chamber. Uh, energy, uh, energy uh, architecture is energy, and uh, and uh, and um, thrust uh, energy illusion. Oh, there's too much. Sorry, just. Um, Okay, you'll have to read the book. So go out and buy the book, <laughs> order it online. You, you can get it for, I, I'm told for $36. This is the, it's, it, it, you know, pay, per page is cheaper than most Bibles. So go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, you can keep showing us the slides, Joseph. I, I thought we were farther along into your, your, your 100, but I knew we weren't anywhere close. Um, I think we'll have to have a, have a, a second session uh, in order to, to cover the rest of it because typical of the book, the richness, not just of these hundred images, but the packing two or three images onto, onto each um, of the slides um, shows the incredible richness and diversity of, of um, the particular strain that you're looking at in the book. So let me ask you one um, challenging question then at, at the end um, to, to, to kind of wrap up because what um, is clear to me in, in um, perusing the book and in um, beginning to enter it at, at certain places, um, including the, the table of conscience where, where people will see 14 separate sections and within each section, even from two to seven chapters within a single section. So um, you have presented to us tonight, thank you very much, a kind of um, narrative line which contradicts the formulation of the book, it seems to me. And even as you explained how you, um, you, you refused to submit to the suggestion of turning it into a narrative or even a history, I think tonight you have kind of given us a history, um, probably um, a little bit of, of the genesis of the book, but, but um, in reading the book, it seems, in the parts that I have read, the genesis of the idea of the book in your own experience is one of the things that you unfold in, in kind of the, the footnote um, uh, lower range of, of the book um, in some of the earlier chapters. So there are always these many things going on in every page. Um, my question to you is, why is this not five books? Why, what what made this be one book to you for all of its heft, right? For all of its, um, you know, manifold uh, subjects that you are, what, what is the coherence, not necessarily a linear coherence to, to the story of the book, but, but why was it necessary to have these all together? Well, I, I think that the, um, there's a coherence um, there's a philosophical coherence. There's the zeitgeistical zy coherence. Um, the, the, all these people relate to each other. Um, if you do a kind of a map of their relationships, they're all related through you know people over here know people over here, and they've talked and they've had students and so. So there's it's a matrix basically. So I've written a matrix, and it's very difficult to separate out the matrix. Um, and if I were to do it. It would also weaken the sense that there was a, this movement that was happening that um, it really is a different reality that they were all addressing in, in their different ways. Um, in the uh, in the deconstructivist show, they all tried to be different from each other, but they all had commonalities as well. Um, uh, uh, the uh, I, I would agree with you that the the book is so packed that a lot of really valuable ideas get um, uh, get sort of smothered because there's so much in the sheer abundance of material that uh, one, I hate to relate my 
my book to Tr Donald Trump, and he was so um, uh, uh, spectacularly um, uh, prolific in his misdemeanors, let's say, that one canceled each other out, and so you didn't, you couldn't focus on one. Uh, and so the, so there, there's a lot. This has an abundance of richness. Um, and so uh, you go from one to the other. And, and um, uh, Tony Vidler said that he wondered why I hadn't broke this out into a lot of articles. And, and, uh, and my response was, had I done that, somebody would come along and say, well, why don't you collect them into a volume? And so, so I've, I've, I've done it as a volume rather than separate things. Um, uh, now, one of the interesting things about this history is that um, uh, I started in 87 and I finished it, you know, just, just published a couple of months ago. So it covers a, you know, a, a, a range of time, about 35, 37 years um, of my life during which I was writing about this material. And so it's a history that's actually contemporaneous. Um, so it's a history that's written from the inside. And um, uh, so it's actually fairly personal, it's fairly immediate, there's nothing distant about it. Um, and so it was a lived history and, and, um, and it's perhaps because it's so implicitly autobiographical, uh, uh, that's why it's in one volume because, you know, it, me and my one life over these 35 years, I, I did it, it seemed like, a, a, you know, togetherness. Uh, uh, you know, I've seen all these buildings um, and um, uh, it was a great passion and, uh, and it's, it wasn't a passion I could really subdivide. It didn't make any sense. Uh, you know, I subdivided chapters. You have to break it down. The, the narrative is, is a collage narrative. Um, it's a thematic thing. It, it does build. Um, and if you, if you read through it, um, the, it, it does go here. I did sequence things in a way that was additive and reflective about what had before. But there are a lot of ways of approaching it. Some people have said they can just dip into it and, and you can read um, parts at a time. Uh, my, one of my Italian cousins said, um, he's an alpine, my family comes from the Alps, he, he's an alpinist. And he said, well, I'm going to treat it like Everest. Um, uh, above the 5,000 meter line, you, you take one, one step at a time very slowly. So he's going to read this, you know, seven to 10 pages at a time. And he calculates that by the end of 2022, he will have <laughs> finished it. So there are lots of ways of approaching it. The, there's also the, um, the um, New Yorker way of approaching it. If you think of all these illustrations as cartoons, you look at it, you look at a picture and you read the caption, it kind of sucks you in and you read around it. And by, by the time you know, finish, you, you've read it apart. So, and so that's a collage form of reading. Um, but, you know, the, uh, so I don't think you should start from the beginning. It's not nonlinear, but it can be, it does. I'm just re reading it through myself for the first time. Um, since it was published, and um, and uh, uh, I uh, uh, and I wrote a lot of it such a long time ago that a lot of it's fresh to me, so it's interesting. I submit it to you like it's like like Dean and DeLuca, um, the notion of abundanza. You, it's just you've got stuff coming off the ceilings, off the walls, and it's all there, and you just kind of pick the uh, the the um, uh, dried tomatoes that you, that you want here, your finocchio, uh, whatever pleases you and, and go for it. Well, basta for tonight, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, but nevertheless, we, we thank you for this, uh, you know, uh, smorgasbord to continue the uh, the the food metaphor, and I think maybe it's time for dinner, being that's what we're we're starting to think about. Uh, but. Um, Joseph, it's, it's really a spectacular achievement um, in, in terms of the 40 years or so of your, your criticism, but also as um, does come through very clearly in the text, your, your, live, your, your intimacy with the buildings and with the architects. Um, and, and for anyone, it's, it's um, sampling the book at, at any point is, is well worth um, the, the experience of language um, as you find the words in order to describe these buildings that um, in and architects that you know so well. So um, congratulations really on the book and I ho hope everyone does uh, um, buy it and read it um, and spend the next year or, or so dipping into it uh, whenever because the, there's you will always um, readers um, find something to enjoy there. So thanks, Joseph, um, very much tonight for giving us the, the, um, the, the introduction and the, and the overview, at least 70% um, or so of it. So. <laughs>
Um, okay, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you, and and um, bye, everybody. See you. Uh, see you in February. I hope to uh, you join us for uh, real estate history, and then New York City history, and on to construction history in in uh, March as we um, we climb more, uh, more more mountains of of construction and architecture. Um, so thanks, Joseph, and bye, everybody. See you next time. Hello, everybody. We'll start in three minutes. Carol, Carol, so then when I turn the video on, then I do I press the admit everyone? No, you don't. You you're a co-host, but you should refrain from admitting anybody. Don't worry about that. That's Jean or me. We'll do that. So all I have to do is turn the the video on. Um, right. You want? Why don't you practice that right now? Turn it on. We'll tell you if we see you. Yes. Yep. There you are. Now turn it off. <laughs> okay. And Jean's letting people in, and we're two minutes from starting. Everybody will start in two minutes. Hi, everybody. We'll start in one minute. Um, okay, it's six o'clock. All right, Jean, we're all set. Yes. Great. I see there are 35 people in. <clears throat> um, Joseph, you're, all, you're set too. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's uh, six o'clock, and welcome to tonight's author's talk. Joseph Giovannini, who will be speaking about his new book, I'm going to hold it up right here, Architecture Unbound, A Century of the Disruptive Avant-Garde. Um, I'll do a brief introduction um, to Joseph, but I think uh, the reason that there are so many people signed up for this program tonight is because everyone is familiar with Joseph's writing from the, um, well, many years uh, that he has been a, a, a critic. Um, he, of course, is trained as an architect as well, uh, especially an architecture critic, but one who is deeply um, familiar with and invested in the traditions of, uh, of art history. And um, indeed, the, the book is as, uh, almost as much about the history of the visual avant-garde um, as it, that is uh, the artistic um, graphic tradition as it is about architecture. So all of you, I'm sure know of his writings um, 
in uh, the New York Times, in the architectural record, uh, in uh, from the 1980s and 90s of New York Magazine when he was the architecture critic there. He has been on the scene um, as a participant observer uh, in the circles of architecture as, as well as a critic um, in the broadest sense of, of the culture of art architecture over these last um, three decades or so. And um, as people enter the room, I um, want us to speak very briefly um, because, uh, well, to speak briefly in an inter introduction um, and allow as much time as, as possible for Joseph because he has a lot of material to show us. And in fact, this is his debut lecture um, to explain the book to people. He's done some uh, conversations about the book, but tonight is really to lay out, um, I think, some of the, of the themes of the, of the book, which as you can see is quite a hefty volume. Now, all of the books that we're featuring in these first um, months of our monthly author talks uh, series are books that are a kind of compilation and culmination of literally decades of, of work. So if you join us in February for Patrice Darrington um, speaking about um, her essentially textbook on the, his, on the history of real estate um, called um, uh, Built Up or James Sanders in early March, um, who will be speaking about the joint work that he has done with Rick Burns in the, in the series, New York, a documentary. All of those books are at least a ream of paper like this. Um, and the, the um, collective work of, of, as I said, literally decades of, of study. Um, Joseph's book, the cover of which you see here, um, and which is uh, designed in, uh, in a, a really beautiful and incredibly ambitious uh, um, craft of book design by Abbott Miller in, in you know, collaboration with, with, with Joseph. I'm holding the book up because I don't think that you can necessarily see um, the, the off-center, oblique, to take one of the terms of uh, Joseph's uh, title, um, angle of the top of, of the book. There are in fact only two right angles in the book and everything else is rather sideways. Now I'm going to show it to you in Rizzoli Bookstore as you could um, see it if you walk in on Broadway and 25th Street. Uh, Rizzoli is the publisher um, and is to be really congratulated for um, the investment they made in the quality of this book. And I, I don't usually hawk the books in our series, it's just assumed that they're, they are all worthy um, products, but um, this book is probably the best value that you can get this year, or maybe even, even in this decade, because this book is only $50 and the, the paper is at least, um, five or $10 and the, I won't open up all of the pages, but what you will see is that um, on every one of these pages, uh, extraordinarily beautiful uh, photography that um, encompasses um, many more than the eight, more than 800 pages of, of this book. So um, I, I, I simply wanted to make the, the introduction um, to, the, to the book, which you can also, I'm gonna show you the graphics in it. Um, I wanted to, to make clear um, that this is, um, that, that the production of the book is a work of art in itself and a, a work of, of, of graphic design arts. And as you can see from the inside pages, taking one of the, um, the, the, the folds of um, the skyscraper subject, um, the, the typography itself and the angles um, that are part of the structure of the book um, also are the composition of the interior pages. Each one of these pages has the same kind of um, composition and construction or maybe deconstruction um, that Joseph um, spotlights in the subject um, of, of his book. So um, I will um, allow, I, 
I'll allow Joseph to explain his book to us now. Um, I'll invite him onto the screen with his camera and he'll share his screen. I hope that we'll have some time for questions um, afterwards, but if you pose some of the questions in the chat box, we will monitor them and then try to collect them for some discussion afterwards. But I have a feeling that um, uh, Joseph is going to treat us to an incredibly full exposition of the ideas um, of the book uh, and uh, again to raise it up again in its title. It's actually got two titles, Architecture Unbound, colon, A, a Century of Dis the Disruptive Avant-Garde. And, and then for good measure, he puts in um, five topics transgressive, oblique, aberrant, deconstructed, and digital. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure how many of those we will cover tonight, but typical of this book, which has in, indeed more pages of text than it does of images, which is uh, a mind boggling uh, accomplishment. Um, you'll, you'll see that the ambitiousness of this book is really something that we need to uh, a guide um, uh, and who could be a better guide to the mind and constructions of Joseph Giovannini than, um, than, than Joseph himself. So um, Joseph, now let me um, stand back and, and let you take over. But thank you for, um, for doing this tonight. Oh, 